What is more dangerous, this uh, virus or the Democrat? Democrats. Democrats. Oh. What's up, everyone? Michael here from Wisecrack, a YouTube channel that explores the weird and surprising intersections between pop culture, philosophy, and history. Today, we're partnering with Amazon Prime Video to give you a hopefully super dope video about the only new film out there to feature a maschini, which is recommended by us but definitely not by the CDC. If any one movie can define 2020, it's gotta be Borat's subsequent movie film. But newsworthy antics aside, all the genius of Sasha Baron Cohen, although jaw-droppingly original, builds upon a pantheon of amazing pranksters who preceded him. So who are these devious ne'er-do-wells? Let's go through Borat's antics one by one and find out. First, create a ridiculous alter ego. Now the first observably bonkers thing about Borat's shtick is the premise. He's dressing up as a Kazakh journalist who regularly employs the phrase, They're nice. Sasha Baron Cohen's exploits as Borat feel almost revolutionary in their brazen craziness. The more interesting truth is that Borat is merely the latest of many stunt characters to demolish the line between theater and real life. Borat shares a theatricality of false identity with one 1940s New York City star you've never heard of, Gorgeous George, a professional wrestler who performed in character as a snooty, fancily dressed man who entered the room to the tune of pomp and circumstance. Dude committed to his part. Having his handlers spray perfume all over the ring before his performance, snobbishly folding his clothes as he removed them, and giving pre-match interviews as he got his hair done at the salon. On one radio show appearance for Troops Abroad, our man Gigi had a group of high-ranking military officers line up like recruits, sprayed them with perfume, and made them recite an oath as they accepted official Gorgeous George gold hairpins. Pushing the boundaries of what's socially acceptable for men to do is also, of course, a beloved pastime of our favorite maskini wear. Whether it's working out within a situation or kissing random men on the cheek. Now, a more obvious historical antecedent for Borat came in 1948 with the debut of Candid Camera, which showcased mostly harmless pranks performed on folks who didn't realize they were being filmed. The big difference between this predecessor and Borat, of course, is that Candid Camera never really appeared to be making a point other than that filming unsuspecting saps can be really amusing. I remove his pubis. I was given honor. Oh, that's great. But when it comes to engaging with folks who don't realize that they're in a performance, Borat's more genetically related father is probably Andy Kaufman. The beloved comedian first debuted in 1974 and became so infamous for his pranking that his early death in 1984 has long been treated as a hoax itself. Kaufman reveled in bizarre and very uncomfortable comedy, inspiring many of your favorite weirdos who continue to employ his antics to this day. He gave weird, disheveled interviews like Joaquin Phoenix later would, and he maintained a straight face through many of his bits like Baron Cohen often does today. But most interestingly, he was a master of provocative false identities, famously giving punishing performances as the boorish lounge singer Tony Clifton, who he refused to admit was even him. Once, he appeared on The Dating Game as his foreign man character and proceeded to start sobbing that it wasn't fair when he didn't win. Perhaps in the process, he was trying to call out the utter stupidity of such shows in the first place. Kaufman loved blurring the line between performance and real life. And as the audience, you were constantly unsure if you were in on the joke or if there was indeed a joke at all. At one point, an increasingly famous Kaufman got hired as a busboy at Jerry's Famous Deli, where he would cater to confused diners who spent their whole meal with that nagging feeling that they knew their server from somewhere. As Borat, Baron Cohen plays with similar tensions. The comedy comes from watching unsuspecting audience members being forced to engage with this absurd character, and their unplanned reactions serve as the most interesting commentary the film has to make. Whether it's pointing a finger at a political figure who is only too eager to be seduced by a young reporter, or a morally upstanding babysitter legitimately worried about his child-rearing uh, strategy. Uh, for water, uh, please use this. We drink water out of a glass. Next, mock people in power to momentarily rob them of that power. You might think of Borat dressing as Donald Trump as particularly zeitgeisty, but to properly place him in prankster history, we gotta take a quick hop back to medieval Europe. Life there was all about feudal order, which means a few wealthy dudes owned all the land and everyone else had to work on it for basically no money. Life was not fun and extremely not funny. Unless you were super wealthy, and even then, you were still pooping in a chamber pot, so not much to be proud of. 
But once a year, the misery came to a halt because it was time for carnival. This is a time when everyone dressed up, got sloshed, ate way too much, danced, paraded, and most importantly, roasted the heck out of royalty and clergy. In other words, it was prime time for medieval pranking. See, carnival was basically a free pass for peasants to F things up. And as a result, it messed with the power structures of this very unequal society. With carnival and the resulting debauchery, peasants weren't just blowing off steam. They were actively disrupting the social order. And that had some real world effects long after all the beer was drained. In 16th century Germany, for example, they'd vent frustration at the Pope by making an effigy of him which was carried through the marketplace and pelted with dung and then hunted through the streets. These shenanigans were essential in upsetting the sanctity of the office, a shift which eventually contributed to the Protestant Reformation and denouncement of the Catholic Church. It also just sounds like a pretty sick time, full of costumed folks dressed as nuns and monks doing the cha-cha slide through the streets. Think Mardi Gras before running water. It calls to mind a quote by cultural critic and theorist Dick Hebbage, who said that the modern age was laughed into being, in large part by destroying the power structures of the past. We see notes of this savage mockery of powerful and respected figures in Borat too, especially, as we noted, when Baron Cohen dresses in an objectively grotesque Donald Trump costume and interrupts CPAC. What follows is poignant. We watch this pretend Donald Trump get thrown out by security, extracted from a prestigious event hosted by his own political party. Not so different from a 16th century German throwing real poop at a fake pope, right? Next, parrot the worst version of someone to reveal their own awfulness. Something Borat is a real expert at is representing the worst version of what people actually are. And he does so to shocking effect. Whether it's getting a father to literally appraise his fake daughter. How much you think my daughter is worth? $500. Ooh, thank you. Or getting a pregnancy crisis center pastor to, um, man, what do you even call this? Now that you know that I am her father, can we take it out now, please? God is the one who creates life and God doesn't make accidents. Kind of like that 18th century writer who told people to eat babies. No, really, but first, some background. Pranksterhood has coincided with the rise of modernity for a very simple reason. You need media to make a good prank. Thus, it's probably unsurprising that each new modern development of media has created new ways to prank. The first big change came circa the Age of Enlightenment, with the increasingly widespread availability of the printing press, and the explosion of new written materials that spread affordably all over Europe. As a result, there was a whole new question. How did you know if what you were reading was true? Books espousing objectively fake realities soon emerged, including a couple that would become the basis for the Illuminati theory that endures today. But our favorite prank of this era came in 1708, when satirist Jonathan Swift, using a pen name, played a pretty slick April Fool's Day prank. He predicted the death of a famous and revered astrologer based on the guy's own fortune telling. He then proceeded to write an elegy for the astrologer with the epitaph, here, five foot deep, lies on his back, a cobbler, starmonger, and quack. Which, I mean, does it get better than that? The same pamphlet also asserted that on his deathbed, the astrologer had admitted that his craft was, simply put, deceit. Audiences reacted, some in earnest, tolling the church bells, sending memorial messages for the dead astrologer, and some in jest, wailing outside the guy's home at night in false mourning. The incident significantly damaged astrology's reputation, and the craft began to decline in respectability until now, of course, when it's back and better than ever. <sighs> Anyway, this sounds akin to Borat's way of getting, say, a pair of very hospitable conspiracy theorists to tell on themselves and voicing their own wild beliefs. We can't do to them what we would like to do because they, they unfortunately, they have the same rights we do. They should have a bit less rights than you. Mm -hmm. I'm not. Well, they, they should. That was a good start for Swift, but dude was not a one-time prankster. Perhaps his greatest hit was A Modest Proposal, a satirical essay in which he proposed a solution to the hunger crisis in his native Ireland, eating babies. Choice quotes include, I have been assured that a young, healthy child well-nursed is at a year old a most delicious, nourishing, and wholesome food, whether stewed, roasted, baked, or boiled. Anyone else hungry? Not to overexplain the joke, but Swift was mocking the wealthy's lack of concern about people who were literally starving, playing on their indifference to suffering by suggesting eating their most vulnerable. And it's a hilarious way to skewer a fundamentally uncompassionate society. We see this same insane kind of button pushing all the time in Borat 2. Let's say I wanted to uh, um, finish lives of 20 gypsy, would this be enough? 
Maybe the bigger one. Uh, the bigger one. Here, Borat is using the same dismissal of human life Swift did to make a point. Next, tell outrageously untrue stories that on closer inspection reflect some kind of reality. Borat uses fantastical tales about Kazakhstan. For instance, saying that women can't drive. <laughs> and that they sleep in cages there to underscore the reality of actual sexism in America. To trace these antics, we're going to start with one guy who at first glance seems like a Borat predecessor, Salmanazar, a blonde-haired, blue-eyed, probably French guy who fooled 18th century London's elite into thinking he was from Formosa, what is now called Taiwan. He told rapt audiences that in Formosa they ate babies and the chimneys were bent so the sun couldn't shine down them. He even wrote a 288-page encyclopedia of his native land, which he had never even visited. But probably the most elaborate part of his prank was his adoption of a fake Formosan language, total gibberish, which he would drunkenly perform at fancy dinner parties. Sounds a lot like Borat speaking fake Kazakh, which is actually just a mix of Hebrew and Polish. <laughs> Also, like Borat, Salmanazar took advantage of people's ignorance and peddled in their bigotry about the supposed backwardsness of a foreign land. But unlike Borat, there doesn't appear to have been anything to Salmanazar's trickery other than access to good food and a laugh. So instead, we're going to jump ahead to the 19th century, a time when increased urbanization brought all kinds of random people into much closer proximity. Meanwhile, new technology created both new possibilities and new gullibilities. This was an era in which con men might switch swindle you on city streets, fake spiritualist mediums might take your money in exchange for chatting with your dead Aunt Ruth, and newspaper reporters might write hoax stories about aliens and giants just to sell more papers. In the mix of this new era of trickery was this guy, Sir William Osler, highly respected medical professor and professional serious looking man. His favorite hobby? Writing into prestigious medical journals, which were then circulating more widely than ever under the moniker of Dr. Edgerton Yorick Davis. In these letters, he described encountering bizarre, sexually explicit cases, including an uncommon form of vaginismus, in which a woman's uh, cavity literally swallowed her partner's private parts. And we don't need to tell you that one was a prank, right? While these letters seem to have been mostly just for fun, we suspect that the doctor was playing on Victorian era terror about the Virgin. and mocking the prudishness of the age. In a parallel that's almost too absurdly perfect, his tale is pretty similar to the Kazakh story Tutar frequently reads about a woman who gets swallowed by her own privates. Next, create a prank that's so fun people just can't ignore it. From messing up a rodeo to leading a crowd in a hideous anthem. Obama, what we gonna do? Inject him with the Wuhan flu. Baron Cohen excels at fantastical pranks that immediately invite audience participation. To see where this performative pranksterhood really comes from, we have to look at the pranksters of 1960s America, who were, frankly, the best. Obviously, this was an era when the counterculture took over. But perhaps more importantly, it was an era when mass media had become widespread, offering new opportunities for next level mischief. Abby Hoffman and his fellow yippies might be the best example. As the first folks to really harness the power of mass media to write their own prankster narrative in protest of the Vietnam War and American society at large. On one occasion, Hoffman and co. finagled their way into the New York Stock Exchange, then proceeded to dump 200 $1 bills onto the traders below them. Some of these walking money bags booed at the stunt, but many began fighting over the money revealing their own greedy intentions. This is what a really good prank does. In its absurdity, it reveals deep truths about the people being duped. This feels a lot like Borat requesting a cake that reads, Jews will not replace us, or leading a crowd of Americans in that song. Okay, journalists, are we gonna inject them with the Wuhan flu? Or jump them up like the Saudis do? Okay, let's hear it. Here, the prank is far less about the absurdity of Borat's cake decorations or original song, and much more about the complicity and active participation of his audience. And it's pretty brilliant. In another stunt, Hoffman applied for a permit to levitate the Pentagon, which was eventually granted, though he could only levitate it three feet because American bureaucrats are weirdos. He was attempting to exercise it of evil to put a stop to the war, and he performed this exorcism to the delight of the media. This sort of faux mysticism also contributed to other trickery. A group called Witch, standing incredibly, 
for the Women's International Terrorist Conspiracy from Hell held a carnivalesque protest against the sexist beauty standards of the Miss America pageant, in which they crowned a sheep Miss America. They then proceeded to toss, but did not burn, their bras in a trash can. They also dressed up as witches and put a hex on the all-male House Un-American Activities Committee. Their anti-sexist activism, particularly at Miss America, feels like an obvious foremother to the decidedly messy dance prank pulled by Becca Lova, in which she mocks the sexism and hyper-propriety of her debutante ball audience by revealing her moon blood. Finally, put it all on camera. In more recent years, filming or televising your pranks is practically mandatory if you want to gain any traction, as the likes of everyone from Michael Moore to the billionaires for Bush to the yes men to Vermin Supreme could tell you. There's no video of Abby Hoffman dousing the New York Stock Exchange in $1 bills, unfortunately, nor of the 18th century pranksters waiting outside the home of that poor astrologer. These stories exist only as mythos, or written records, or the occasional photograph. But nobody can contest the existence of a Borat prank, which thanks to the magic of modern media, has burned that image of Rudy Giuliani lying down into our eyeballs forever. He was just adjusting, right? As a result, his theatrical but decidedly political agitation has a new staying power. And it uses that power to force us to reflect on America and on ourselves. In this super brief history of pranksters, one commonality arises. Like all the tricksters who came before him, pulling the wool over the eyes of those unsuspecting audiences, Baron Cohen creates pranks that disrupt a status quo, offering the possibility of imagining new realities. Like one where we don't have debutante balls where fathers show off their pubescent daughters. Or one where crisis pregnancy centers don't tell women to keep their unwanted pregnancies. And that's the true power of a prank. Also, they are very funny. So try one on your roommates or family today. Big thanks to Amazon Prime Video for partnering with us. If you're jonesing for more Borat content, check out our other video on the Wisecrack channel. And thanks a ton for watching. Later. Look at this, this is what it's like working on a studio.